Having a personal server rack for a non-enterprise individual at home can be a bit cost prohibitive, starting with the cost of the rack itself and going down the line of components. It has long been a dream of mine to have a server rack, but up until very recently, I really never thought it would happen. But if it did happen, should it be enclosed, open, two post, four post, 25 rack units tall, 15U? 42U. After watching prices on Craigslist, eBay, Amazon, and others for well over a year, I stumbled on this four post 42U open StarTech rack for an incredible $270. And I'll put links in the description for everything mentioned here. So if you're interested in checking out more or getting the same things as me, uh, definitely check out the description of the video. I honestly thought there was probably a mistake or something like that, like this was a mislisting or something. I was just looking up the rack that Daniel had just bought, you know, the co-author of the Neural Networks from Scratch book, NNFS.io, and I couldn't help but notice how cheap this 4-post 42U was. It was actually cheaper than most of the smaller variants, and normally this one is like 400 plus dollars. So I had no choice, and I bought it. Now, the real thing to really push me over the edge and start thinking about actually building a home lab was this concept of network area storage, or NAS. At this point, I have over seven machines, but are for sure seven machines and like 30 different drives of varying sizes spread across many rooms and various transfer speeds. And I say for sure because I have other machines that sometimes I turn on and sometimes I don't, or like laptops, stuff like that. But seven like real machines that are constantly running, doing things, and yes, 30 plus drives. Like, again, I'm not counting some of the drives because I might not use them anymore, but it's a lot of information. A lot of stuff is spread around. Uh, it's, it's a huge pain. With things like neural network model sizes themselves, often gigs or bigger in size alone, and you generally when you're training or even transfer learning, you're trying to save like a bunch of those models as you go on. And then data sets themselves are often terabytes in size now. I just I wanted more storage, but I also really want to centralize all that storage and, and try to eke out the best read and write speeds that I can out of that, especially given that now I own a few machines with 10 gigabit. So I knew I wanted a NAS, and you could do a desktop NAS or a rack mount NAS, but the fact that I wanted a NAS, I was like, that that's really what pushed me over the edge to make me think, you know what, I should actually start rack building. I've got all these machines, all these computers, networking, power, all these things are hugely problematic. So I should really build a, a rack. So this is what pushed me over the edge. So in pre-built rack mount NAS land, there's mainly QNAP and Synology. Now QNAP is at least currently 30 to 50% cheaper than Synology for like the same thing, but this probably has something to do with the public sentiment towards QNAP given fairly recent and close together attacks and ransomware on their devices along with arguably poor public communication around these events. Then you have Synology. It's $2,400 for a driverless, so it doesn't come with the actual drives, 12 bay NAS unit. And then if you want 10 gigabit, you got to buy a separate $150 network card for 10 gigabit. Also, these rack mount NAS units can often sound like jet engines. This is because they're generally the smallest form factor that they can get. They've got these very small fans and you want to generate high airflow. And generally, these are expected to be running in a data center, not another room that a human lives or works in. But I want to put this rack into the same room that I'm recording videos like this one on. So I priced out building my own 12 bay hot swappable unit with 10 gigabit for $1,600. Beyond this, it's going to be far more quiet, completely customizable going forward, and more powerful. I can also very easily repurpose this entire thing for some other use case. It doesn't have to always be a NAS. So the case that I went with is this 4U Rosewill 12 bay hot swappable unit. The only downside of this case was that like cover for the hard drives. Uh, it has a key and it's locked, and I, the case did not come with a key. There is no key. <laughs> So I ended up actually prying this open. Now the good news is I didn't intend to use this anyways. I actually wanted to take it off and I did find out how to take off that case cover. But if you did want that case cover and that lock just to kind of block away like the USB and stuff or just the drives, they are hot swappable. So it'd be very quick and easy to like take a drive. So if you wanted that functionality, um, maybe watch out for the case of the missing key, but also just know that this was like unbelievably simple to pry open. Like I just basically pulled it and it came open. So like I didn't have to try very hard, but otherwise I, I really do like the case. And like I said, I had no intention of using that cover anyways. The motherboard that I went with is a Gigabyte Z590 Master, and this was $200 and it comes with 10 gigabit. 
Given that a 10 gigabit card alone is $150, this seemed like quite the steal. Along with that, it has six onboard SATA and 16X, 8X, and 4X PCIe. Again, I might want to repurpose this and use that 16X one day for a GPU, for example. And it's just nice to have that there as an option. I'm also going to use the 4X PCIe for a SATA expansion. So I have the six onboard ports and I need at least six more to expand to the 12 you know, hot swappable drives. But then I want a operating system disk for the NAS. I also probably want a redundant operating system disk and then another one for cash. The socket on this motherboard is the LGA 1200, so I had a, quite a few options, but I went with the Intel Core i5-11600K. This is more than enough to power this NAS, but I will admit this is like the weakest processor I've bought in a long time. For power, this is where I went the most overboard. I got a Corsair RM 850X Gold. 850 watts is massively overkill here. It will never draw that much as a NAS, but I just can't stomach buying anything less since I may indeed one day wish to stuff a decent GPU in here, repurpose it, or maybe have this unit as a multi-purpose unit. Um, or maybe I just buy another NAS later on or something like that. I'd rather just be able to be lazy about how much work is entailed. And I just don't like a something like a 300 or like a 500 watt PSU that can really only power machines like this. And getting a little more wattage out of the power supply is not very expensive. For RAM, nothing special here. Two 16 gigabit <laughs> gigabit. Two 16 gigabyte sticks of DDR4 RAM. This is plenty comfy for the use case here. I never purchased any quiet fans, but Noctua fans came in the fractal design casing for the workstation that I got from Puget. And I'll put a link to that build in the description, but I think the biggest thing that like really blew me away about that build, and it's a very high performance build, it was how quiet it was. I work right next to it and I simply do not hear it, but it can keep two 3090s cool, no problem. <laughs> so this completely reversed my stance on quiet fans and quiet PC builds. And for this build, I bought some Noctua 120 millimeter and 80 millimeter fans to replace the fans that the case came with. Finally, for the actual storage, I have four 18 terabyte Exos Enterprise hard disks. Uh, for this, I was really looking for, yes, bulk storage, but then also I was kind of just pricing out the cost per terabyte, and 18 terabytes was pretty fair. Um, 8 terabytes, 10 terabytes, especially the 10 terabyte disk for some reason, uh, were quite expensive per terabyte. And then also they just recently-ish came out with 20 terabyte disks, so these are also kind of expensive, I think, as people are rushing to get the highest amount per. So I went with 18, and this is plenty comfy uh, to start with. Now, to power this NAS and the rest of my rack. I had wiring for 30 amps at 240 volts on a dedicated breaker. With a 30 amp 240 volt power distribution unit, that could theoretically provide me with 7.2 kilowatts of total power. And that's off a single outlet and single cable going to the rack. Then this PDU would distribute that amongst all of the machines in the rack. So I hunted for a 30 amp 240 volt power supply and I landed on this one. Unfortunately, that listing is a bit inaccurate. It's actually not 30 amps, it's 24. And we can confirm this by looking at the official documentation for this unit. That said, I'm okay with this for now. It's kind of hard to find a 30 amp at 240 volts where you actually get the full 7.2 kilowatts. Most of the units that I could find leading up to this and even after I found out that this one was 24 amps, they still all seem to claim that peak power of 5.8 or 5.7 and some change kilowatts. So I think this is about as good as I'm going to get for now, unless I'm ready to spend some serious coin. Um, but even so, I still have an unused 20 amp 240 volt outlet on its own breaker entirely as well. Uh, so if I do somehow max out this 5.8 kilowatts, I've got plenty more to work with. The specific PDU has both C13 and C19 receptacles. You probably recognize the C13 and then maybe C19 if you have a higher wattage PSU. The typical power cables, at least in the United States, are going to be something like C13 to a NEMA 515. Well, this is problematic because we don't have any NEMA plugs or NEMA receptacles on the PDU that I bought. So instead, you either have to buy new uh, power cables or a cable that's going to convert from NEMA to the C variants. At least for me, I bought new cables just so I could get the exact lengths that I wanted. So for now, my power problem is solved. Beyond power distribution and storage, 
Uh, the next order of business is networking. I have a lot of devices with varying speeds and the needs of those speeds, but I've got a solid four-ish machines that I'd like to have networked at as high a rate as possible, or at least financially reasonable. <laughs> but the more the merrier. And I have lots of switches, one pretty old switch that is like 100 megabits per second with 24 ports, and then another one with 16 gigabit ports, and then that's 16 ports with gigabit. Anyway, uh, and then I have some other switches and stuff floating around. But that said, I now have five 10 gigabit capable machines that I, I like the backbone of my local, you know, network in my office area. I'd like that to be 10 gigabit possible. And 10 gigabit switches are expensive. And it's hard to even just find switches with more than like two or four 10 gigabit ports. And then the rest will be like 2.5 or one. But I did find this TP-Link with eight 10 gigabit ports for a pretty good price. It's still fairly painful, but uh, for 10 gigabit, it's actually a really good price. So I went with that one for the main switch and kind of the backbone. That said, I'll be reserving these ports for machines with 10 gigabit only. And it only if I actually need that speed. Uh, there are plenty of machines where there's just no need for 10 gigabit, but mostly I'm trying to use that for things like video editing or the machines that I need to move data sets or lots of models on to and from, all that kind of stuff. So for sure, I will have the NAS networked there, a couple of my deep learning computers there, my main computer for like video editing, stuff like that will all be on there. But then I've got other switches for things that just simply don't need that much. Next as a sort of aside, but not really, are the sliding rails. So I went with these universal rails from star tech sliding rails are super cool but either extremely expensive and still needing to be like retrofitted to the case that you intend to use i will say some cases and equipment do come with quality rails it's not like they, they don't exist but it's just pretty rare it seems <laughs> and then the ones that you can get are either unbelievably expensive or just way too untrustworthy to risk multi-thousand dollar machines falling on yet more multi-thousand dollar machines in a cascading fashion so to help me sleep at night, I went with something I can actually just put my faith in, and I got these uh, universal rails from StarTech. For things like the switches and stuff like that, ear mounting is totally fine. Same thing with like the PDU, that's ear mounted. But for heavier things like the NAS unit and some of the computers that I'm going to be putting in there, I definitely want something that is trustworthy. For the software side of the NAS, I've gone with TrueNAS 13. I put the operating system on two solid state drives for redundancy, and then I've got another 240 gigabyte SSD for cache. I found a super helpful video for setting things up in TrueNAS. I'll put a link to that in the description. What I will say is I came at this knowing really nothing about RAID other than what it stands for. And Daniel suggested to me RAID Z1 for four disks at a time, and that's what I did. With RAID Z1, the one is tolerant for one disk failing and no data loss in that VDEV. I'm going to build my pool of disks four at a time with each four making up one VDEV or virtual device. In the end, I'll have 12 total disks, three VDEVs, and each VDEV will have four disks each, each with one tolerant to failure in that VDEV. I'm starting off with these four 18 terabyte drives in RAID Z1, so that gives me approximately 50 terabytes of storage to start with. And each VDEV that I add will be another 50 terabytes for a total of about 150 terabytes of storage in this case. Now that might sound like a lot already, I will say I've only, I'm just starting with 50 terabytes for now, but I already have over 25 terabytes of storage spread across many machines. And that's with me being fairly brutal about removing data sets, models, uh, especially things like when I pre-process data sets, um, I, I, I toss the pre-processing and keep the raw data set just for storage purposes, but it would be very nice to be able to save those pre-processed data sets as well. So I definitely look forward to being a bit more comfy with uh, storage and honestly expect to fill out 50 terabytes pretty quick. So after feeling for years like my own server rack was a bit outrageous and even more so like a 42 unit rack, like how am I ever going to fill that? Um, I'm left feeling like I should have done this a really long time ago. <laughs> I've for so long had five separate machines that I use very much simultaneously, and it's very difficult to manage them in like every way, the data, the IO, networking, and even just powering them and not tripping breakers. Um, like when I plug in a vacuum <laughs> or something like that. So I've had to distribute them across multiple rooms. And then that also, that distribution makes all the other things hard, like IO and networking and all that. The rack 
just solves all of this and just makes a lot of sense as a form factor. It also is going to wind up reducing the uh, space usage of basically all my other machines are like workstation-y, desktop-y type machines. Whereas in this case, it's like I'm able to stack all of my she machines in one, one spot. There's also a definite kind of cool factor, I suppose, to customizing the entire rack and just kind of like planning things out. I've got an Excel spreadsheet essentially where I've marked all the units. You know, each cell is a rack unit, for example, and I'm just kind of planning out where I'm going to put everything and all of that. And just being like such a modular form factor, I'm just finding it really enjoyable to like plan and engineer out the layout and, and, and everything that goes along with that. So truly just like making a custom rack just for me, just for what I want. I spent a lot of time looking at things like Home Lab on Reddit and stuff like that, and it seemed like like everyone's rack was something that like I just didn't understand. Like, why would you want that in your rack? Like, what's that doing for you? And it just made me feel like, what would I need a rack for? I don't need any of those things that these other people are putting in their rack. Why would I need that? You know? And then like I don't know. One day it just kind of clicked, and it's like, wow, I got a lot of computers and compute and storage and all these things that man I really wish that was in a rack and the networking and all that kind of stuff and then like all of a sudden it's like oh yeah it's like completely customizable it's just like a computer like it's you make it whatever it is that you want so anyways I'm, I'm finding that really cool and there's like so many unique things that you can add to your rack and stuff like that and anyway I'm just really looking forward to continuing this build and sharing the journey with you all because this is just the beginning and to be honest I pretty much already know how I'm going to fill this entire rack. So stay tuned for that and till next time.